Okay, stand by. Oh, you have all these like secret questions. They're gonna like spring it. Right? Oh, they're good. No, I got some <laughs> good questions. <laughs> I'd like to try to ask what's happening. Okay, my dear, anytime. Yeah, you like to. All right, hi. Hi. Foul. This is Osiris with Stones in the Color of Rare blog and Ankh Entertainment. And we are interviewing um, a rare stone today, uh, Rafal Zielinski, is that correct? That's right, yeah. Polish um, name. Polish name, good old Polish name, who has uh, several projects called, uh, one is called Forgiveness, and my favorite, uh, The Tiger Within. And um, it was written and acclaimed by the screenwriter Gina Winkos, I, I think, who was with, um, she did Princess Diaries. Right, that's right. So why don't you talk a little bit about your projects and what's going on with them and let the audience, our, our listeners. Sure. Audience. Well, uh, Tiger Within has been a project that I've been trying to do for several years and it's very close to my heart. And uh, I think it has a really beautiful theme. Uh, the theme is forgiveness. It's a story about two people of two extreme backgrounds who are total opposites, who have to come together and learn how to coexist, become friends and forgive each other. It's a, there is a girl who is 14 and a man who is 90. And so there is a, it's a contrast of age and she's a skinhead and he's a Holocaust survivor. So can you, you can imagine the the conflicts and the contrast and the obstacles that they have to overcome. She's a girl, he's a man. So there's a lot of interesting issues. And it's a film um, that it's a very beautiful, um, inspiring and emotional story, which I think will have a, hopefully a, um, a positive and healing uh, effect on the audience. And it's written by you know, a very good friend of mine, Gina, um, and uh, myself and Gina originally started off um, with a film that she wrote called Ginger Ale Afternoon, her first film, which I directed and produced and it went on to the Sundance Film Festival. And that sort of like um, was our beginning. And, it, and since then we've always been friends and we've always been talking about making this Tiger Within, which has been a pretty elusive project to get made in Hollywood for some reason it's fallen apart so many times as if waiting for the right moment in time and I feel the time is right now because this film although it's a very small little intimate story it um, has huge ish, huge sort of messages and issues and I think resonates on a much bigger scale to the whole world at large it um, you know it touches upon a lot of conflicts that are going on in our world today and Perhaps it's a movie about world peace, perhaps, because if these two people can, you know, learn to forgive each other, come to peace within each other, perhaps the whole world can, it's symbolically. Yeah, so, I, interesting you yeah. should say that I had a wonderful time watching uh, the uh, little video clip that you have on your site. And like I said, I love the cartoon animated thing. And to me, it gave it much more depth and it made it much more real for me. Now, what... Some of the questions I came up about Tiger Within and Forgiveness was that I noticed that uh, most Hollywood movies would have probably twisted um, the relationship between Samuel and um, Casey, who was a young girl that was 14 and Samuel was a Holocaust survivor, would have twisted and made it intimate. I like the fact that you made it almost like a father, uh, you made it like a father, a very symbiotic father and daughter type relationship, not an older man with a younger woman and there is a sexual attraction. And I wanted to know what caused you to use uh, that sort of theme versus the typical sexual Hollywood theme that I'm... Right. Well, I think, you know, first of all, he, he's a person who lost, you know, his family in the camps. He lost daughters. He had two twin daughters that, uh, he, that were only maybe three or four years old. So in a way, um, seeing Casey, it's like the daughter he never had the chance to have. So, um, you know, it's an opportunity to make her into a lady, to pass on a lot of knowledge that he would have loved to have given to his daughters that he never had, you know, never got the chance to have. So it's a very, very sad and bittersweet thing for him. But, and for her also, because she comes from a broken family, her mother, um, 
there's no dad around. Her mother, you know, has, is going through a string of boyfriends and always the boyfriends have a conflicted relationship with Casey. So she never had a father figure in her life. So in a way, the two complete each other and they become a family. And one of the, I think, beautiful messages in the film is that, she, you know, Samuel says, you know, if you were born in the wrong way without a family, you can always choose a new family. You can always <laughs> yeah, choose a new family. Always. Which is an interesting concept, you know, uh, you know, because family is so important to all of us. And those are extended families. I mean, I personally, and then I know people that have been raised by different people based on their relationships with their, I say their earthbound families. Right. Yeah, I mean, I, I truly believe that, you know, we're all family. The yes. whole, we're all one. I, you know, I had the opportunity to, to travel and live all around the world when I was a teenager. And I so, sort of started to see the whole world as one, you know, all people and nations, religions as one. And in a way, you know, we're all one big family and then perhaps that's one of the messages of the film. And that brings up the, que not a question, but I wanted to talk to you a little bit more about your own childhood briefly. You mentioned in the uh, vi video that your father worked for the Ford Foundation. I'm like, wow, the Ford Foundation, I mean, the Ford Foundation is worldwide famous, so I wanted you to kind of elaborate a little bit more on how his working for the Ford Foundation and you growing up as a child, uh, how you were able to merge those two worlds together in order to come up with this kind of thing. Right, right, yeah, well, you know, my father was a um, very well-known um, ex, sorry, he was a very well-known um, um, engineer who developed uh, systems for low-cost houses, um, modular concrete um, prefab houses, because they were reconstructing Poland after the war, so they had to develop new technologies to, cr to build really fast, to rebuild the whole country. So then um, that knowledge he was able to pass on to, through the Ford Foundation to developing countries all around the world. And he was stationed in many, we were in the Middle East first rebuilding, you know, settlements. And then we were in, um, in this is actually in, in Egypt where they were, the Americans were trying to rebuild the city of Aswan and expand it. And I think they were competing with the, there was the, the Cold War, they were competing with the Russian influences who were trying to build a dam in the Nile, so it was sort of like a political situation. Mm. So anyway, so my father was in charge of building, rebuilding the whole city of Aswan and developing it. And then later he, we were sent to India, to Calcutta, where um, you know, there's a huge demand for low-cost houses. And, and ha Calcutta is like the world's, the, the hellhole of the world, they <laughs> say. Uh, there's so much poverty. And um, I mean, literally one of the first projects that he did was he developed a latrine, a prefab a toilet that could be put on the streets because there's no toilet system. All this, all this sewage would just go in open dish, ditches. So, so um, they, they prefabbed like millions of these toilets and started putting them all over the streets of Calcutta. That was one of the first projects. And then the floods came and there were refugees in Bangladesh. So he was rebuilding whole villages for the flood refugees and then he started building all over the in, all over India, teaching you know the the local population, the local engineers how to build low cost houses. So you know we were very fortunate. We were always traveling all over the Far East and the Middle East and the Asia, and um, I was exposed to so much. And I always had a little camera. You know, since the age of seven, I was always filming with my video eight camera. I mean, my super eight camera, <laughs> and. Uh, I became like the filmmaker who was always hiding behind the lens because it was awkward, you know, switching so many schools. I always mm -hmm. felt very disfranchised and very much sort of like a loner. So I could hide behind my camera and just film everything. So I think that's how I became a filmmaker. And I always thought that, you know, film could be like a spiritual, something that could be spiritual, enlightening, illuminating. And I came actually, I went to MIT to study technology, to learn how technology could be incorporated into all of this. Mm -hmm. And um, may I just um, take a little sip of your orange juice? I'm going to steal. It's not on my side. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and uh, being exposed to, to, ev to all these places, and um, I just felt that cinema had the power to illuminate, inspire, and entertain. 
And I came with the dream to Hollywood, but there was a rude awakening. I mean, <laughs> Hollywood just doesn't work that way. You know, it's not about, it doesn't seem to be like about the projects or your ideas. It's more about the politics, the connections, you know, how you play the game. And I was it's pretty getting... bad at playing the game. Yeah. So I stumbled a lot, you know, and I did a lot of like Roger Corman films, but I was <laughs> always trying to make these like, you know, films with these Deep. dreams, you know, like let's change the world, let's, you know, Cause. teach people about life and death, about reincarnation, about, you know, we're all one, about forgive. but none of those projects ever, you know, sort of resonated with the producers, the agents, the studios, you know, whatever. So I, I was, so I decided, you know, with this new digital technology, I'm just going to like reconform all these projects and instead of making big movies out of them, find, make little movies with big themes. And that's the new direction I've been going recently. Wow. You know, and trying that's a to good make small little going. intimate movies, but hopefully that resonate on a that's bigger scale. That's a great scale. direction. As a matter of fact, um, the, one of the wonderful things about being an independent filmmaker in today's times in the world of film is that you have these major production <coughs> companies now that are seeking you out. Uh, just so you'll know, Greenlight Films right now have partnered with a bunch of the major independent film studios that are really you know, big and doing well. And they are going directly to the artists themselves now because you have agents and people, like I said, I came out of William Morris, you have people like that and they literally block things um, because they may not get to know a person like Rafal. Whereas we're out here, we can meet you and know how profound your film is and expose it to a larger audience. So in knowing that, I wanted to, um, did you yourself feel like you were a misfit? I mean, I know I've always been a misfit and I don't care now. But yeah, no, I, I always yeah, felt so. as a misfit because first of all, <laughs> you know, I left um, Eastern Europe, left Poland when I was like around seven. So I don't even remember that country and I don't feel... I mean, I don't feel part of that country at all. Perhaps in my soul, I, you know, I have some of that romanticism that Eastern European has. But I, I never felt Polish. And then when I came to America, I felt like an outsider in a strange land. And then when we went to, you know, lived in India and Calcutta and all over the place, we always felt like strangers in a strange land. And then... When I went to MIT and I tried to study technology and I was like an artist, a sculptor, you know, trying to make art in a very sort of scientific, um, sort of nerdy environment. It was very nerdy at that time, was being a stranger in a strange land. And then coming to Hollywood, I felt like a stranger in a strange land. So I guess all my life I feel that way. No, so, you, Hollywood is a yeah. strange land. You're the we're the, you're the same yeah. person. <laughs> I don't know. It is a strange land. Yeah. I don't um, know. But by the way, I wanted just to talk a little bit about the tiger with you. Yes, yes. As part of our process of making the film, we started a blog because we wanted to for the film to have a sort of educational component. So we started like asking people what is forgiveness because we wanted to learn about it and how it would apply to our story and how it applies to the Holocaust, how it applies to the world and conflicts all around the world. So we started interviewing like, a, you know, rabbis, priests, Buddhists, and we started posting these on, the, on our blog. And then it sort of evolved into like a side sister project, a documentary on forgiveness. And that led me to start a non-profit uh, organization for the purpose of making Tiger Within and the sister documentary and the sort of new direction that we're trying to go into is from now on we want to make a series of films that inspire, illuminate and entertain and they are feature films but at the same time they have a sister documentary that's attached. That's interesting so and what is it, the name of that, what, that non-profit? It's called um, filmartplanet.org and the idea is that, you know, no one gets paid. We all contribute our time. We, we all make these films because we hope we can, you know, change the world and make it a better place. And then if we are luckily, you know, lucky and these films get distribution, um, whatever revenues we get back, we put back into the pot and we hopefully make another one. And right after this one, uh, I want to make a movie based on a play called... Uh, um, calling Aphrodite, which is a beautiful play I saw a couple of years ago mm. about survivors of Hiroshima. 
and it's a beautiful play written by Velina Houston um, about um, two girls who are 15 who are happen to be right at ground zero in Hiroshima when the bomb goes off and then they are you know disfigured and they lose their whole family their mm -hmm. faces you know completely melt in a way and then they, they become part of the Hiroshima Maidens project which is a real project that happened where the Americans sort of feeling guilty a couple of church groups organized to take 25 girls from Japan the most horribly disfigured and they brought them to New York this is in the 1950s it was a true story and they gave them plastic surgeries so they could um, you know at least have some semblance of looking like a human being and a lot of these women died you know for, from cancer I mean they went to horrible hor horrible experiences but they became ambassadors of peace of world peace and I think the world is in such a precarious state you know now with the possibility of a of nuclear, you know, a nuclear bomb going off somewhere, whether it's, in, you know, in the Middle East or in the Far East, you know, it's getting more and more likely. And even, you know, during the Iraq war, I, I, Americans were saying, oh, let's just nuke them, you know. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know, it seems like we've forgotten the horror of that. And it's the most horrifying yeah. thing that could ever happen to humanity, the, the pain and the suffering that these people have gone through. And it's sort of so sad because, you know, Japan feels embarrassed about it. They call it an accident. And the Hiroshima survivors are very ostracized in Japanese society. They're like hidden away. And Americans feel very embarrassed about it, so they don't talk about it. So it's like another theme of forgiveness. So Absolutely. we hope to do a sister documentary about nuclear war and, and you know, what it can lead to as we make that film. And then the next thing after that is a movie it, it, is about based on the Tibetan Book of the Dead, which mm -hmm. is about life after death. Yeah. It's about the journey we take after we die. And the idea of that film is that, you know, we have to treasure every moment of, of our life as we live, because when we die, it's all recorded and we, we revisit it and, and it all leads to the next life. And we so, take a lot for granted. Yeah, we do, we, yeah. Humans, yeah. We so take we have a to... lot for granted. We don't think we can die. I mean, a lot of people don't think... Right, you know, you death is something that's just like, completely oh, yeah, like hidden me. away in our society. And it can happen in any so we hope to do time. a sort of sister documentary, yeah. you know, about life after death and people who perhaps can remember past lives or what is death to people. That's so. death. That's an interesting subject because there's a lot of that goes on, you know, especially this time of the year. What I wanted to get back to in, in talking about the theme of forgiveness, as I was talking before we went on camera, is... Do you think that the happiness and forgiveness go hand in hand? Do you think um, in part of your um, interview, you mentioned that the reason that you like using female characters is that you were able to build and develop much more complicated uh, streams of thought or something with female characters. Right, yeah, yeah. And I, and I wanted you to expound upon that because I found that very interesting. I've never heard anyone say that before. Right, well, I mean, there are two components to your question. One about happiness, right? Yeah. Well, you know, and I, I don't know what happiness is. I don't think anyone really knows. I don't think really, as human beings, we really, you know, we really desire happiness because once we get it, it's very boring. You know, happiness just leads to no change and no growth. So I think unhappiness is very much, very important in our lives. And I think that's what, in, in a way, cinema is all about. It's like there's a hero and something goes wrong, leads to unhappiness. And this hero has to go through a whole process to resolve things. That's what cinema is. That's what all stories are, in a way. That's the arc we, we all have to go through in our lives. So um, it's, it's the search of this elusive happiness which doesn't exist but it's the journey, it's, it's, it's the, the process that we all go through. And you know I've tried to apply that into my films, you know I, I, I haven't been fortunate to make even a fraction of the films I was hoping to make but I decided you know from now on it's like it's how much love into, you put into every little thing, it's not about how much you produce or how big the thing is that you produce, it doesn't matter whether it plays in a million theaters or makes you know billions Absolutely. at the box office, 
even if it plays you know, one, on one little screen or just on the web, you know, it, it's the process that counts. It's, you have to put the love into the making and that's what I think our lives should be, you know. It's how much love we put into every moment of our lives, not the end result, because the end result is death. Just that, that's it's it, over. right? In the so what's the over. point? <laughs> what's the point of like, you know, collecting billions and accumulating all this power and that's true. When in the end you have to give it all up anyway, right? Or leave so, it to someone and they <laughs> make mush. Right? It. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so and regarding you know the female characters, um, I I've always been interested you know in in the female protagonists and I've always I guess had female strong female protagonists in in my films. Because in, in, I think in a female character you can, you know, combine a lot of, you know, sensitive, vulnerable sides to, you know, with the aggressive sort of male characteristic. And I think women are goddesses, you know, they give birth. I mean, that's a miracle. They, they, they have this miracle which we don't have, so we're very inferior. You know, so studying them, I think... Um, is a great lesson for all of us. <laughs> so I've always had, you know, strong female characters. I've always been interested, and I'd, maybe it's because I can't figure them out. I, I have no idea. I, it's I'm a still, thing, I'm still isn't trying it? to work them out, you know. Yeah. And um, they definitely make more interesting characters, at least for me, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, what do you feel that? Um, uh, what do you feel about the, the world of cinema with? people like yourself, I want you to know that maybe when you first got to the U.S., that was a problem, but now, I mean, it's like more, it's like a weed that is infection right now. It's so many different modes of uh, how to do films, what the film's going to be about operating right now in, a, in the small world we call entertainment that it is opening a lot of doors simultaneously. So what do you feel about the future of independent cinematographers, filmmakers? Yes, like well, I, I think what's, in one, on one hand, what's really exciting now is that, um, you know, the tools are all accessible and it's very inexpensive now to make a film, number one. Number two, we've all been brought up now to so much exposure to the media, to cinema, to television, to the, we're constantly living in this, when you know, in this type of environment where, you know, even games. So, you know, there's not as, we are not, no longer reading as much or writing as much sort of cinema and the audiovisual experience has been, become our way of communicating. So we're all partaking in the process. So in a way, we've all become filmmakers. And so maybe, you know, the filmmaking gods of the past are, <laughs> won't exist anymore. We will all be filmmakers and... But on the other hand, you know, we can all be writers. It's so easy just to sit down and write a book, but very few of us can actually have the patience to actually do that and have the, the, a bit, the chance to do it because we all have to make a living, Absolutely. you know. So, um, so maybe cinema will give everyone an opportunity and break down all the, the barriers and gate, you know, eliminate a lot of the gatekeepers. But at the same time, it's going to become much more competitive because now, if you're really good, you have to um, really rise above, you know, and the cream always rises, yeah. you know, in the always, end, always you know, the people who um, are not only talented, but also are, you know, have a sort of, um, I, I guess, to take, Humanism. you know, you have to be both talented and humanist, but also you have to know how to play the world. Let's say, you know, we live in a Shoot. very... <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, we, even if you are like in a little schoolyard, you know, there's politics. Everywhere yes. there's politics. Everywhere. Everywhere it's how you interact with other human beings. So you have That's to true. learn to play the game of you being a human being to rise above without, you know, being destructive or negative to people around you. So, mm -hmm. so in, I think it'll give a chance, you know, for hopefully talented people to rise and uh, shine and um, and keep on you know working but on the other hand you know it's tough because like Andy Warhol said you know <laughs> in the future everyone will be famous for five seconds or whatever <laughs> it is so you know now everyone can can be famous can for, have a crack at it but can you be famous for your whole lifetime that's or, or you know can you produce and have the chance to to produce and and become you know a um, someone who can reach you know millions of people consistently okay. for your whole life—that's a question. Can that be, can that 
be done in the future. You know, but the other thing I wanted to say is that, you know, the whole world is becoming very globalized now, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe, maybe uh, Hollywood used to control the whole thing, but now maybe it's diminishing in its power. I mean, there is amazing, you know, China is very powerful, India is very powerful, the whole world is melting and, you know, and, and um, you know, maybe the, the whole film business won't be so centered on the Hollywood anymore. And also, uh, life and living and Mother Nature has a way of swinging things into balance. And right, yeah. When something has been so much on this side, eventually, just as a natural way of life, what happens naturally, it would swing to the other side. That's right. Because yeah. it has to find that chudo, you know, that right, middle yeah, way. Yeah, yeah. And so I think that's what's happening. Um, I would like for you to just, uh, again, say your name. Sure, say I'm, the name of your organization, sure. say where people, the audience, if they want to contact you, donate to your project, announce your, uh, your um, nonprofit organization status, and let the audience hear where they can reach you and how they can reach out and uh, talk to you about forgiveness. Right, that's right. Well, I and how to harness their tiger within. Speak directly right. to the camera. Well, from. Yes, well, we, um, our nonprofit is called filmartplanet.org. And it's the organization that will be producing and is producing the current feature film we're working on, Tiger Within, and the sister documentary, Forgiveness is the Future. And we're about to launch a campaign on Kickstarter and, and other initiatives to raise funding. And we encourage you to please donate to filmartplanet.org, which you can do right on our website and to find us on Kickstarter in the new future and to sign up for our newsletter and our Twitter and our blog. And at the same time, to encourage, I would love to encourage you to buy some of my past indie movies through my online store, filmartmovies.com, because the revenues from these films are going to the non-profit Film Art Planet, which will enable us hopefully to make these future films. So the two are very interlinked. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. It's been a pleasure talking to you, Rafael. Thank you. Again, Rafael Zelensky, Tiger Within Forgiveness. Please go on the site. It's an amazing, amazing story. We can't wait for it to see it in theaters. This has been another Ankh Entertainment Stones in the Color of Rare production. Okay, just look Thank at the you. camera. I'm just get a, I need about 60 seconds, just a little portrait of you. Okay. Big smile. Come on now. Smile, <laughs> Forgiveness. Peace. <laughs> Peace, love. Good.